Yes, sir. Hey, Mike, won't you, is somebody sitting there? Come on down. That court not to be so formal. Uh, explain, you know, what is the purpose of this hearing? What is the purpose of this hearing? that this class was coming, I was kind of curious about what you guys were doing, and what, actually what I was going to give you. Um, if there's one thing that I could um, tell you about me, uh, it is repertoire is everything. And it is, it's your textbook. I can't think of another class that you're going to, that is taught in your schools where you wouldn't get together in a committee and decide this is what we're going to teach. A textbook is the way it's taught. So if you're a science teacher, you're going to, and let's say you guys each teach at a different school, uh, you need to find out what in your county you're going to teach. So if you're teaching science, you get together and go through volumes of material to find one book for, say, fourth grade history science or whatever that you're going to teach, but in this case, each of you are going to be totally responsible for what it is you're going to teach as your curriculum. Um, even your, I mean, your principal's not even involved. They may be involved superficially, and that superficial involvement might even turn into be more than superficial if they start to tell you what kind of music they want to play. But, Given, a, given a, an environment of education and creative learning, then you are going to be held accountable to what you give your kids to teach. That's a pretty serious consideration, I think. So how do we come up with um, repertoire that we're going to give to our students? Um, so tell me just a little bit about you guys. What, what repertoire do you know? Before we even do that, what do you want to teach? What What are you? What grade or what are you thinking about? Because he's at college level. Oh boy, you got it. You're an undergrad now. Yes, sir. Okay. There's just a lot of things. Not very many those around. So, why? I, I'm not going to go here. I'm just curious. Why do you do you think you want to teach it? I like this kind of talk. I can see the struggle. Yeah. That's good. That's not bad. It may seem bad. It may seem confusing. It may seem divisive, in, even in yourself. But it's not. It's healthy. Because out of all this question will come some sort of truth. It won't be the truth, capital V, but there will be some sort of truth that comes out of it. Throughout my uh, experience as a musician, I have I actually really enjoyed conducting. I mean, I would be conducting in my car, in a shower, and then recently broke into an actual class for it. But that was something that I enjoyed, and something that I enjoyed about being in band was the experience that I had as a band member. And it was 
was that experience that I wanted to give to other students. All the, the teachers that I had when I was in when I was in high school, when I was in college, when I, as I was in college, is an experience that I, it was always something that I wanted to have somebody else experience. All of this experience also it seemed a little bit self-serving or pretentious to think that I could affect students as much as the teachers affected me, but that was my yeah. only objective. It, I don't think it's pretentious. I think it's uh, responsibility. At first, it may seem self-centering, uh, but very quickly, you'll figure out that it's not, because the truth will come out of that as well. I mean, you learn as much from the students as they Well, do. in a way, We'll talk. We'll talk a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to try to be specific to the repertoire here, but I was trying to figure out where we are. What What do you want to do? I love to teach at any level. What do you want to do most? Um, probably high school. Yeah. High school, and if I get to the college, that'd be fantastic. But if I'm at the high school level, I just want to teach and give back to the community. Yeah. Um, I Michael Thompson's teacher said, and I'll read this. 
He says, you, this is Peter Gorski talking to Joseph Thomas. He says, you know, the life of, of a performer is a terrible thing. You play a Brahm sonata, and Brahm is great. And you, you may hear like an insect crawling around on this great sonata, trying to make clear what it is. You play Brahms. No matter what you do, you're not as good as the sonata. On the other hand, somewhere you find a little piece of crap, a little ditty, or a song, or something like that, and you take that piece of crap and you dress it up. You put a portamento here, and then you put a, tr a tremolo, or a bassano, or a vibrato, a little choreography, and this and that. And he says, you know, and then you play that piece of, of music for the public. And the audience goes crazy. Absolutely crazy. And you feel great because the audience is applauding for you. After all, the composition is just a little piece of crap. That's an important thing for you to remember. Very important. And you can be, you can be, um, and it, you can be kind of sliding by and somehow seduced by this popularity. So you have to find, I once saw a Nike poster, and it said, find a place to stand and you can move the world. The first object of business is to find a place to stand. What is it that you believe in? So the first, the first, first thing that I can offer for you guys to establish a place to stand is to listen to great music, unquestionably great music, and find out why it's great. For example, uh, if you were in the other classes, you know that I love Mahler. And so uh, I believe Mahler is great. But if we were to have a discussion about Mahler, I could tell you why I believe Mahler is great. And my idea of that may be different than yours is. But it's not enough for me to say to you, Mahler is great, and for you to accept that and then just move on about your business. If you love something, you need to define for yourself why you love it why it's important to you. And if you can do that, then you can you can begin to define things that you're going to give to a fifth grader. And so so you imagine when you go out to teach and you're teaching your your little kids and so we run across each other in some sort of a workshop someplace and you say, but Mr. Green, I don't I don't listen to Mahler because I'm teaching middle school kids how to play how to put their instruments together. And I say to you, I understand that. I did that too, but I think it's important for you to listen to Mahler. Because, because it will it will always give you a star to aim for. Always there will be something hotter than what you have at the moment. Um, it, I, it, as I told you, Lincoln Trabosi was one of my first. There were others, but Lincoln Trabosi was one of them. So um, I want you to think about the music. And, and if you're not decided, and I understand, I don't think it's, I never want to be a college band director. I just want to be a high school band director. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, I love, I'm still, I'm still a high school band director. I'll always be a high school band director. I love being around high school kids. Um, there's something about the energy, there's something about, and I just love it. And, but, uh, so, here's why I'm a college band director. And this is this is a curiosity. Curiosity is a funny thing. If you want to be if you want to be a college band director, if you want to be a high school band director, if you want to be a middle school band director, you better find out what's out there that you can teach with. Because if not, you're going to be stuck with whatever Hal Leonard says is the newest best thing, and it may be nothing more than a piece of pablum that they're putting up and everybody will buy it because audiences love it. Or and there's nothing there to teach. It's possible. Believe that. So, how do you make a decision if, if if you guys are all together and you're looking at and you're looking at a catalog? How do you decide what you're going to teach? When I was a kid, and I'm going to tell you why I left high school to, to be uh, a college band director. Not quite yet. Um, so, when I look for music with my middle school bands and my high school bands, well. I gotta be really honest here. My first high school band, I was a French horn player, right? I was so eager to go out and teach, I just looked for stuff that had good French horn parts. 
And the clarinet parts are ridiculous. And the blue parts are just really hard. But the horn parts are good. So everything sounds like French horn. You know, the flute sounds like a tiny little French horn, everything. I wouldn't. That's the truth. I mean, I wasn't able to just determine. We had repertoire classes, and I knew about it, but I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't think of it as being my textbook. I didn't think of it being teachable. So I, so I had to learn. And composers that I liked, I mentioned earlier. People like Claire Grumman. I love to teach middle school and high school kids. Claire Grumman. Do you know why? Sounds pretty good when you play it. Al Reed sounds good when you play it, too. It did, but here's something that I look for. The thing I loved about Claire Grumman was he wouldn't keep you in one key signature very long. You'd play along and then you get really comfortable and he'd throw a key signature modulation right in the middle of something and it just sound awful. Remember that in your mistakes lies a positive reaction. In your mistakes you will find how to be better. So if I if I play something with my kids, it's in B flat concert all the time, I'm really not teaching them. I make them sound good, but is, is that all there is to it? So I look for things in composers, and I would now. I, I honestly, I don't know young man stuff anymore. I don't know young man stuff anymore, and that's kind of scary because at one time I knew all of it. When I was doing it, I knew all of it. But you can tell I'm really dated about by the names that I give you. I can't give you names. You know the name Brian Dalmagus? He was his buddy. He roomed with him. He was in, he was in my, my band, and he was learning his craft when he was at Miami. In fact, he was going to talk to me about it. If I was a guy teaching that, I'd do it right now. But I guess my point is, if, if, if you don't know the names of people, a lot of people that you've looked at, actually looked at scores and listened to on the internet or Wherever you can find it, um, then you're missing out. Fred Finnell, uh, who is a person I mentioned earlier, Fred taught at the University of Miami for 10 years. And then Alfred Reed taught there, and then there was a, a short period of time that I, I went. And so uh, I was lucky enough to inherit all that. But Fred Finnell, um, <coughs> Fred Finnell is everything. Have you ever listened to the early recordings of Wiesman went on Have you? Can you remember any of the pieces they played? Well, you guys should know that stuff. It's on their rep list. Yeah. Listen, when, when he gives you guys lists and stuff like that, he's thought about it a lot. And you need to take that stuff and then just a curiosity, you look at it and go like, what, what's that? Go listen to it. And listen carefully. <coughs> because it's super, super, super important. You can't know who you're going to be until you know who you've been. You can't know what's tomorrow until you know yesterday. And you can't have yesterday unless it's serious, unless it's real. So, Fennell, uh, I got it. Fennell, taught at the University of Miami. And he came back after being gone for 20 years. And it was, when he left Miami, it was not a pleasant thing. It was tough. And I'm not going to go into why. It was just difficult. And Phil Fennell had more to do with the repertoire of the band today than anybody else who's ever lived. Anybody. Anybody. I, I can't think of anybody. Even the great Bill Rebellion. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example of the University of Michigan band under the belly, and now under my hate cover, and how the repertoire has changed. But Fennell found all this music of Clifton Williams and people of the 60s, 70s, and the late 50s, um, and he, he brought it to our attention. He was the first person 
that said this counts. Really counts. And it's important for you if you're, if you're going to teach, no matter what, it doesn't matter. It's really important for you to know this. This is your history. This is who you are. You owe this to your students and students who will be inspired by you to become band directors. And that will happen. So you owe this to them. And so Fennell uh, came back to the university. And it was interesting. After being gone for 20 years, and it's interesting. He played, he conducted uh, Van Baron Legro. He had his score that he had worked with with Pippin Wayne. And he conducted the second movement of Al Reed's Third Symphony, the variation on Torazzi Day. And it was an amazing experience. Uh, just so Albert Reed was still there at Miami. And Clifton Williams, of course, taught there. And he had his scores. He had his own score to Torazzi. When, when he'd send me stuff to prepare the ensemble, he sent it in a box. His, his own parts, his own scores were marked the way he wanted to. And it wasn't just thrown in a box, it was like it had those little styrofoam peanuts in there. Mm -hmm. And it was all wrapped up and it was so carefully packaged up. I, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I could not believe it. So he came and he, he conducted the ensemble and it was it was an unbelievable experience. There wasn't anybody in the room who wasn't just like jaw on the floor. And life changed. And then uh, I asked him one night at dinner while he was at Miami, I said, when's the last time you conducted the Florida Allstate Band? And he said, never. But it was my year to conduct the Allstate Band. And I said, if I can talk him into it, will you conduct the Allstate Band with the sheriff? He said, yeah. <coughs> so I introduced him. We, we did, it was a long story. We, we finally got to the point where we were going to do the Allstate Band. And, and um, I played in this all state band. I played in the Oklahoma All State Band two years. I played once with Ravelli and once with Fennell. So when I introduced Fennell to the to the band, I introduced him as the founder of the Eastern Wind Ensemble, conductor of the Tokyo Kosai Wind Orchestra, the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra, University of Miami Wind Ensemble conductor and my all-state band director 40 years earlier. It was really cool. I mean, it was so great to be around that. You have, I tell you that because I want you to have a sense of purpose. I want you to have a sense of being. And the way you, you attain that is by knowing exactly what you're about. Um, and you're at a point in your lives now, and you're mature enough, you're old enough, that this is becoming more than just kind of, I think I might want to do something. You're pretty close to uh, getting out of here, so you need to think really seriously about it. this is what you're doing. So you need to know those early Eastman Wind Ensemble recordings and what was on there and why they were important. Okay? So, um, so that you have a sense of, of being and, and who you are. So, I was a high school band director in Spokane, Washington, my last high school band job. I taught high school band for 20 years. My last job was in Spokane at the University High School. And I had done Major Posey, and I had done Hindemith Symphony, and I had done La Fiesta, and First K. Um, are those, those pieces, are, those are landmark pieces. So I was wondering what I was going to do next with my high school band. Ingo Dahl Symphonietta. I mean, it was like, I'll take all the rest of them, and I mean, they don't even come close to the difficulty of Dahl Symphonietta. And I did. And I, I, I went to step over the line. And one night we were having, we had a we had marching band rehearsal on uh, Tuesday and Thursday night. We never did marching band during class. Tuesday and Thursday night. Games. And so when concert seats are, I did concert band uh, evening rehearsal. Uh, from 6 to 7, 
we did second rehearsal seven to nine, we did full ensemble. So we're in the Doll Symphony, Symphony Edda, working in one of my students, first trombone, Lee Bogleman is his name. He's looking at his watch. And I said, Lee, are you bored? And he said, uh, Mr. Green's 11 o'clock. I, <laughs> I knew that screwed up big time, big time. I lost them, and I love those kids. So the next day they came in, they came into class, and uh, everybody was upset. No, they weren't. They were ready to play. I said, there's no instruments today. So we sat down on the floor. And, and I sit down in the middle of it and I grovel for an hour. I, I apologize. Because I loved it so much. But obviously, I was, there was things in my ear that I wanted to learn about. And I wasn't going to do it with high school kids. And that's why I became a college band director. But I never would have done that had I not have had some idea about where I was going. When I started, first teaching high school band at, at University High School, not, not at uh, Weezer. But by the time I got to university, um, if you were going to go out, if you were going to go out today and teach a high school band, what, what would you give? What repertoire would you give? Any idea at all? Okay, we have beyond souls. It's okay. I don't know that I'm. Did you give me something you want to do like a concert? <coughs> I've listened to enough stuff from this class and certainly from my own experience to have some idea of what I know. I know how some of what you were talking about interpretation. I can think of a few if, if there's any stuff I'm across the go to do that for I mean I can't really think of a reason why they would be better than other yeah, it's cool. It, it, it really is cool. And it's 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 an unfair question. Here I am, 73 years old. How old are you? Yeah. I've got I've got about 53 years on me. So I mean it's just it's not it's not a fair question. But on the other hand, it's extremely fair. Because I I wasn't 73 when I was 20. Okay? So how do you what, what is it that you're going to bring along? Um, the tradition of who you are. So where did bands, when they first started, you, you'll know this, you're just hearing it from a stranger. Uh, where did bands get most of their repertoire other than marches? Where did they get the repertoire that they played when they first began to be bands? Absolutely. I had recordings of Bill Rebelli's first high school band in Hobart. I should, I should put it in my brief days and bring it. It was recorded with a, high, with, with a wire recorder. He played at the National Concert Fan Festival. The judges were A.K. Hardy, Cornet Soloist, Clark, Clark, mm -hmm. and John Bill Sousa. Those were the judges. Uh, Ravelli didn't have a staff teaching his high school band. He taught. He went to the movie theater in Hobart and borrowed percussion equipment from the house theater band. They had those things for the movies, I the movies in. And he brought it to Hobart so he could have percussion equipment. Um, and he started, you know how he got to start the band at Hobart? They wanted a pet band in Indiana, for goodness sake. They wanted somebody to play for basketball game, but he, he did that plus quite a bit more. Do you know anything about Bill Rebelli? You should look it up. Just, just me mentioning his name, you should look up. Just Google, why would this old guy come from Florida and mention somebody like Bill Rebelli? Trust me, you, you'll find, and I'll bet you you've heard the name before. Just, I'm just trying to reinforce here. So, Ravelli played transcriptions. The, the recording I have of his high school band is a transcription. So that's the that's the model that I grew up under. My high school band director went to Michigan and studied with Ravelli. And uh, so that's what I was taught. And so when I got when I got out, uh, it was my 
began to teach, I didn't know. I, I mean, I, I, I knew about Hinman at that time. He was around. First day, pageant was around. Uh, there were quite a few pieces that are still alive today that are really good. So everything that I had in my band was um, yellow paper. Been around for a long time. The instrumentation of my band uh, was normal. I probably had 17 clarinets. Um, I say normal for that time. I probably had eight flutes, six eight flutes, one inch saxophones, two euphoniums, two or three tubas, maybe five, six trombones. Uh, as many horns as I could get. Um, I had six shepherd crook cornets and two trumpets. Because that's the sound that I heard. That's the sound that I knew. It fit the transcription model. So, a guy by the name of Dan Buckfitch came to one of my rehearsals. You know that name? He's an older guy now. When I, obviously, when he came to my rehearsal, he was very young. And if, if you look him up, you won't have, he teaches at the University of Idaho. But he did a piece called Symphony in C. And it had uh, effects other than what fit my transcription model. And he came over, and he was teaching me this music that I just thought was crazy. Kids had to whistle in them. They had to do things that uh, I, I just thought were not, it wasn't in my picture book at all. But I did it, and it was with great pain because I had to break a lot of the ear stuff that I that I knew I could do, and without any question, and enter into a, an era era that was not as comfortable for me. I was uncomfortable in it. Um, changed everything. It changed the way I heard sound. People used to tell me that the band had sound. I think it's got an unlimited amount of sound. The difference depends on what you're playing, how you look at it. So, guys, uh, the more you can immerse yourself in learning about the repertoire, the better off you're going to be. He can give you all kinds of lists, but they're just lists. And they don't mean anything until you embrace that idea and really engage it. Can you tell me any composer that's writing today for any, any ensemble that's important to you? To Kelly's good? Who? Valmages, okay. Any others? That's, that's okay. <laughs> so give me, give me one. Uh, I really like how it's going to be. Me too. Um, actually, I found recently that I developed something good at Chase for Frankfurt. And then uh, uh, Mr. Sider over there has turned this on to the phone. Can I get the first or third suite that we listen to? Oh, Jaeger? You know who it is? Dustin? Um, we listened to it, we listened to the second group that you guys analyzed. It wasn't there, the composer. Holst. Holst, the thing. Oh, I don't have to turn you on, Holst. <laughs> well, I mean, I hadn't heard much of it before. I hadn't heard a lot of Von Williams before. I thought you were going to say Clifton Williams. No, he's good. <coughs> I like the stuff that we did. Yeah. All these guys are great. And that's where we are in the class, really, because midterm hasn't happened. So yeah. we're right there at about 1940. You're in a good place. But get ready. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff going to happen next. But okay, so that's that's great. So how well do you know these composers? You need to know them really, really, really well. Um, Alfred Reedy lived right across the street from our, our band hall. He used to come over and hang out. And uh, I had several of the scores. 
that he gave me a manuscript here at my house. I left a lot of school at the university when I left, but I took all of them. And others like that. Um, but I wouldn't say that I love Alfred Reed's music, just all of it, because I don't. Um, but I loved Alfred Reed, and I loved him a lot, a lot of his music. Um, okay, so the world is going to change. Uh, I can't, this is a repertoire list, and this is a, let me see if I can get to this. Here's a University of Michigan program when uh, Ravelli was the director. Pray to Act One, Lohenberg. You know who the composer was? Uh, yes, sir, thank you. Good. Uh, the trombone uh, solo by Arthur Fryer. Waltzes, uh, German waltzes by Austria, Austrian waltzes, who, who would be the composer? Blue Danube, blah, blah, blah. Uh, 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 Strauss. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, Fabricio Italian. Fourth Symphony, fast. Big notes. Tchaikovsky. So that was, th those were on his, when, when Bill Rebelli was the uh, conductor at the University of Michigan Band. University of Michigan Band had a, a, a concert just um, not long ago. I don't know what all was on that concert, but I can tell you that one of the pieces that was on there was a piece called Masks and Machines by a guy by the name of, of uh, Paul Dugan. Um, here's a, here's a, a program. So that Ravelli, let's talk about when was that program, when did it happen? Uh, late 1950s, Manzoni Requiem. Verdi. Have you ever listened to, to the Verdi Requiem? You should. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I'm just trying to, I'm not trying to be defeatist. I'm trying to be helpful. Um, so that's where, that's where these guys, Ravelli was in the 50s. So here is a, a, is a program let me see if I can get one that might be helpful. Um, <laughs> here's one in, in 2002 by the University of Miami Wind Ensemble. So remember, in Rebelli in the 50s, we're basically talking transcription, right? Uh, so skip over. George Washington Bridge by William Schumann. He'll, he'll talk to you about that piece. Uh, and, there are, and, and when he talks to you about that piece, I want you to listen to the name Schumann, and I want you to find out as much as you can about him. There was a piece that was premiered by a guy by the name of David Gillingham. It was a, it was a concerto, Ellen Rowe. It was written for Ellen Rowe and Maggie Donahue. Yeah. Uh, and songbook, flute concerto uh, by David Masleyan. So, 1950s, all transcriptions, 2002, drastic change. Um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do transcription, not at all, because I don't believe that. I think I told you earlier I did this transcription of Frank Kelly. So I believe in transcriptions, but my standard for transcriptions, if they are to work, would they be as good for the ensemble that you're playing with as it was for the original ensemble? And that's a big question, you have to be pretty honest. Well, could it really stand, stand up to that, okay? So, you're at the beginnings, you're really at the beginning stages, but, but I can't even begin to tell you. And, and nobody can give this to you. He can give you exams, he can do all kinds of things, but if you don't love the stuff he's, the class that you take with him in repertoire is the most important class you take. I mean, I'm not, don't mean to diminish the others, but repertoire is the most single important thing you have because for now, Years later, after Fennell and I did the Allstate band together, he was, he became, I can, I, I can tell you so many things about Fennell. I loved him. I still do miss him. But I asked, I asked him about the year before he died. I said, who would you commission 
to write for the wind ensembles today. Here's the man that had more to do with commissioning wind ensembles than anybody. He couldn't give him one name because he'd given up his ensemble. He was no longer teaching. He didn't have my hand. You think that's not a sobering thought for me? That's all I've done is commission. Uh, and it is sobering, but, but it also is, it shows me how much importance I place on that. It, and Fennell helped me. He looked at me and says, you have to remember, and this is 10, 15 years before I retired. He says, you have to remember, prepare yourself for the time that you don't have your ensemble, because at that point you don't have a voice. So I'm, I'm fighting that a little bit, a little bit. I'm still, you know, still trying. But the important part of that is, not that I don't have an ensemble anymore, the important part is that I put myself in a position so I would know when the time came, what I was wanting to do, what I was what I was thinking of when it comes to repertoire. If Stravinsky were to come to, to this town and go down to Mom's Cafe and have breakfast and announce it in the newspaper, anybody that wants to know about symphonies and wind instruments should be here about 10.30 because I'm just going to hang out and talk. Everybody that cares about music should be there listening to it. That's just how that's, that's how you guys should attach yourselves. You really have to do this because if you don't, then your textbook is null and void because you can't name anything. The reason why there is the whole suite is a great piece. It is a great piece, and there's a thousand reasons why. There's a million. It's un, it's un uh, and I want I want everybody to know that I do, and that's that's really important. So, when he gives you these things, um, don't just get the answer and then go on to the next place. Imagine standing in front of your ensemble in your little, your little town, and you're going to teach these kids to play something for a festival, and you're going to spend like two months on it. When you finish, don't you want to leave something of impression, that's lasting, musical, more than any rating or a concert? So it's how can I teach them to phrase? How can I teach them good tone? How can I teach them to change, to, to modulate it? What a modulation is, and a transition. If there's no good transition in a piece, then you can't teach me about transition. I have a score in my, in my possession that was used by Frederick Fennell and Percy Granger to record Nature Posey and Eastman. I have it. And it's, it's written in both their hands. And Granger says, in his handwriting on this story, he says, Dear uh, Frederick, thank you for this greatest gift, this recording of Ming Jerbozy, and for making even my poor transition sound good. That's your job. And so you get, just have to find something worth your time. Don't do anything that's not worth your time. Because you'll burn out. You do burnouts because boy. Find ways to be excited and find ways the way to be exciting and be excited. Then you'll never burn out. Any questions? My good friend Tim Watson, how you get who Tim Watson is? Yeah, he's a he's a motivational going <coughs> in your session just ask for questions. <laughs> Pretty much over. Good, thank you. Yeah.